so who is the most vulnerable to sexual exploitation? Abigail is a courageous young woman currently studying law at university and is a survivor of sexual exploitation. When I was younger, um, I was about four years old, my cousin and his mom and dad, my aunt and my uncle, came to live with us. And um, from the moment that they came to live with us when I was four, my cousin would sneak into my room and sexually molest me. That lasted till about I was eight, and then he raped me. It created a lot of anger inside of me, and from there, my mom just didn't really know what to do or how to deal with me, so I had moved from living with her to living with my aunt for a little bit, and then living in foster homes, living with friends' families, living back with my mom, and then back into the shelter. And then finally, at 16 years old, the government allowed me to live on my own on social assistance. Kids who are not supervised, right, they're given their own space, they're given their own place within the child welfare system. They don't feel like they have a connect to people. They, they feel like they're kind of just out there in the world. Uh, alike to everyone, they're searching for people that they're gonna you know, belong to, feel safe with, feel that they mean something to. I define sexual exploitation as um, any type of exchange for any type of sexual act for something. So it could be that the child is exchanging a sex act for drugs, for money, for a ride, for a place to stay, for anything really. That would be my definition. I'm uh, Detective Martin Dick. I am the lead detective here at the Holt Regional Police Service Human Trafficking and Vice Unit. A lot of these girls are craving something that they don't actually have. So if someone offers them an opportunity that they don't have or offers them what they perceive to be a relationship that they don't have and it, it's easier or, or there's less thought goes into making that decision. One day when I had gone to pick up drugs, my drug dealer had, well, him and I were talking about where I was living, my, um, my living conditions, and uh, he had said, you know, now that you're making more money, why don't you look for a more comfortable place to live other than this rundown room? Uh, I know a, a guy who owns a home, and uh, I think you'd really like living there. So I, so he got a hold of who was then, would become my pimp. He got a hold of him and him and I met at a restaurant and we sat down and we talked and right away I, he was extremely charming, extremely beautiful. Um, and uh, yeah, I just said, sure, I'd love to live with you. And within the next week I had moved into his home. After you've been raped or molested, you already feel impure. So to, th to think that you could sleep with a man for money isn't really that much of a, it's not that scary. For the most part, these young people come from uh, backgrounds that perhaps are not the most stable. Um, they maybe have issues in relation to a lack of a, of a father figure within the home, uh, you know, coming from broken homes. Perhaps they, you know, often we find that they in fact have been victims of sexual abuse as a child. Um, you know, they have witnessed sexual abuse as a child, domestic abuse as a child. They maybe come from a home where alcohol or drugs is a, a major factor. You know, the average age of entry into the sex trade, uh, certainly from a youth recruitment point of view, is 14 years of age. So when you take that, like that's an average. It means that you know clearly there's there's children younger than 14 being recruited into the sex trade. Um, we, in actual fact, have had a, a number of underage victims of human trafficking that we have found and intervened with uh, here within the region. Um, what I do find is that it's mostly Canadian girls that we find. 
uh, that are being trafficked here throughout Canada.